am a Christian first and last. I'm created in the likeness of God Almighty to bring Him glory. I am a member of Team Jesus Christ. I wear the colors of the cross. I am a competitor now and forever. I am made to strive, to strain, to stretch, and to succeed in the arena of competition. I am a Christian competitor. And as such, I face my challenger with the face of Christ. I do not trust in myself. I do not boast in my abilities. Or believe in my own strength. I rely solely on the power of God. I compete for the pleasure of my Heavenly Father, the honor of Christ, and the reputation of the Holy Spirit. My attitude on and off the field is above reproach. My conduct beyond criticism. Whether I am preparing, practicing, or playing, I submit to God's authority and those He has put over me. I respect my coaches, officials, teammates, and competitors out of respect for the Lord. My body is a temple of Jesus Christ. I protect it from within and without. Nothing enters my body that does not honor the living God. My sweat is an offering to my master. My soreness is a sacrifice to the Savior. I give my all, all of the time. I do not give up. I do not give in. I do not give out. I am the Lord's warrior. I am the Lord's warrior. I am the Lord's warrior. A competitor by conviction and a disciple of determination. I am confident beyond reason because my confidence lies in Christ. The results of my efforts must result in His glory. My God keeps it 100, 100% 100 of the time. He wants all 100, won't settle for 99. And it's more than stats, because there's people in those numbers. And I was one of the lost sheep. I'm so glad he cares for all 100. I'm 100% safe, 100% free, 100% love. I can be 100% me. He gave all 100 when they put him up on that tree. That's 100% passion for 100% free. So if I play in front of 100, or if I play in front of two, there's an audience of one getting a hundred percent of what I can do. Welcome to Fellowship of Christian Athletes Night of Champions. I'm Rodney Droud, former teacher and track coach at Lincoln High School, now serving as a North Lincoln FCA area rep. And I'm Robbie Trent, Lincoln area rep. We help coaches lead their athletes to Christ. We couldn't be more excited that you are here with us tonight. I know all of you would have rather been together in person on this weekend for the weekend of champions, but we are so glad that we could come together tonight all across the state of Nebraska and beyond to be encouraged and challenged. That's right, Rodney. When I think about the highlight of every single year at Grand Island Senior High, you guys are unloading the buses there on Saturday morning as strangers, engaging with the one true God in incredible worship, teaching, competition, and huddle conversation, and then leaving on Sunday afternoon as friends for life. But as FCA State Director Chris Bubach has reminded us during these unusual times, there's no plan B. This is God's plan A. So let's max this thing out. That's something I'd say to my athletes all the time. Whether they won or lost, set a new PR or fouled three times, I'd ask if they gave me their best. Their best. That's 100% all the time during practice, competition, and the rest of their life. And that is exactly what we want you to learn tonight. Over the next 90 minutes, it's our hope each one of you will walk away from the Night of Champions knowing what it means to go 100%, not just in your sport, but in everything you do. And that's why we're wearing these sweet shirts. We want to remind you of 100%. This logo is everywhere. It's all over social media. It's on ESPN. It's on our language. We hear it all the time. And by the end of tonight, we want you to think differently when you see this logo. This is what God calls us to, and it's only through Jesus Christ that we get there. So let's get the shout out started. Uh, post in the chat wherever you're tuning in from and how many people you are with, whether you're tuning in with your huddle, team, small group, or family. 
Give yourself a shout out. Our staff is online. They would love to celebrate with you. And give an amen. Amen. To, come on now. Amen. To any responses of truth that you are really in, impacted by. And we would love to see you guys post on there any questions you might have. We want this to be as interactive throughout the night as possible. So for those of you who are checking out FCA for the first time, you're getting a tiny glimpse of what God is doing in the lives of coaches and athletes all across our state throughout the entire year. And we're so excited you've chosen to join us tonight. Here's what you should expect tonight. We will have some praise and worship music, a talk from Coach Ron Brown, two Husker athletes, and opportunities to discuss what you've heard. Before we begin, I want to open in a word of prayer. So please, bow your heads with me. Gracious Father in heaven, it is by your abundant grace that we are here tonight, and we lay at your feet our gratitude for providing this time and place to grow in our walk with you. Thank you, Lord, for the many that have worked behind the scenes to make this event happen and for all the moving parts to come together perfectly. We pray hearts and minds will be open to your word and lives will be transformed to give you 100% in every aspect of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. In just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Olson and John Wooten of the band Voda to lead us in songs of praise. So let's pretend we're all together rushing the stage to join Brian and John. Turn off the lights, get on your feet, turn up the volume, and let's worship our Savior together. Let's go get it. Ladies and gentlemen, Voda. Have you ever seen the one? Glimmer of first sight as the eyes begin to open and the blindness meets the light. If you have so say, I see the world in light, I see the world in wonder, I see the world in light, bursting in living color. I see the world your way And I'm walking in the light Have you ever seen the wonder In the year of second life Have you come out of the waters With the overlay So say, I see the world in light, I see the world in wonder, I see the world in light, bursting in living color, I see the world you way, and I'm walking in the light. I see the world in grace, I see the world in gospel.
Friends, so good to be here with you in spirit. I wish we were all in the room together. And that day's coming. I hope you are well. We just sang about a God of wonder. And he sure is. I'm sure so many of us have seen things even this past year in our lives where we don't understand, we can't figure it out. We're not sure what God is up to. I don't know about you, but when I see the magic of God's creation, things that I don't understand, it builds faith in me. I hope that does for you. There's so many questions I'm sure you have that you wish God would just give you the answer to. So many questions seemingly left un unanswered. But tonight, you know that this God of mystery and wonder that's created amazing things, that has allowed some amazing things and some crazy things in your life, you don't have to doubt how he feels about you. That has been absolutely clear. He adores you. He loves you dearly. That's why he sent his son to die for you. And he wants to give you a life that is full, to live in boldness, to go forth, knowing that he wants to walk every step with you. It's pretty awesome. God said it wasn't going to be easy. He promised us that, but he did promise that he was going to be with us. So I hope that you would walk in boldness because we need young people that are bold with who they are. And you know what? Many of you are athletes. Many of you, maybe you can sing. Maybe you can play a guitar or piano. But your definition, who you are, goes way deeper than your talents. It goes way deeper than your family and where you came from. If you've been bought by the precious blood of Christ, you are now in the family of God, and that's what defines you. You are a child of God, and God wants to set you free to be bold and to go after this world and all its mystery and wonder and the open seas of everything out there and to go with boldness knowing that he walks with you. That means sometimes we're going to stumble, sometimes we're going to fail, sometimes things are going to be difficult, sometimes things are going to be amazing, but it's going to be worth it. I hope you don't live too safely. God is calling you to the open seas. We want to lift his name in the song, Oceans, because you were meant for those open seas. You were meant for those waters, and he's with you in them.
trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Man, if you guys were brave and stepped out of your comfort zone and got up and worshiped, give me some praised hands in the chat. Earlier I talked about 100%, and a man who has always been a great model for me is Coach Ron Brown. He's a longtime Division I football coach who once served as the Nebraska State Director for FCA, and he is now serving as the Director of Player Development with Husker Football. Before I bring him out as a weekend of champions tradition, let's turn our phones off, lock in, and receive what the Lord has for us tonight. Please welcome Coach Brown. Thanks, Rodney. FCA Nebraska, how are you? Good to be with you tonight. Love FCA here in Nebraska. Chris Bubach uh, and the gang, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to address you. The dilemma I have in addressing you is that I may only be talking to one or two of you. I hope I'm talking to everybody. But what I'm about to share tonight is about a, indeed a rare scenario that happened some 60 years ago and a rare man, a very unique man. But I really believe that God calls this man normal. We, I got a hunch, when we hear his story, are going to, are going to want to say that he's abnormal, that this is like over the top. This is too much. You know, in the midst of COVID pestilence and crazy politics and the world of in your Facebook <laughs> and inept character in sports. Therein lies a man named Jim Elliott, missionary to South America, 
Back in 1956, Jim Elliott and his men went on a very powerful and unique expedition to the most dangerous tribe on the planet, the Alca Indians in Ecuador. So I'm talking to Shadron and Bennington and Lincoln and Sydney and Omaha and all the places in between. Tonight, as you listen, I want you to put yourself in this man's position because he's just like you in many respects. He's a human being with flesh and blood. And it's a, it's a, it's a sports story, but sports is not the main thing. It's not the idol here. It's Jesus Christ who's supposed to be the king. It's all about him. And this man who used a sport to prepare from the most dangerous mission, perhaps, that the world has known. Jim Elliott came from the state of Oregon, came to a college that we are pretty familiar with in Christendom called uh, Wheaton College in Illinois. He came in, and many considered this man a legalistic guy. He read his devotionals in the morning, sold out for Jesus Christ. How many of you are sold out for Jesus Christ? But he was pushy about it, too. Anybody he would see, he would say, have you done your devotional today? What did the Lord speak to you about today? He irritated a lot of people at Wheaton. And you know what? Rightfully so. He really didn't have a whole lot of cooth to him. Uh, he, he didn't understand, you know, just kind of the context that he needed to have as he presented his faith in Jesus Christ. But he read 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, where he's, he was reminded that Christ had given us all things to enjoy, but certainly to glorify him with. I mean, he was getting on, guys, about going out on dates going to movies, playing ball. It was just like, hey, get ready for a mission trip. That's why we came here, isn't it? But Jim Elliott began to understand that God had given him these wonderful things and these friends around him, not to separate himself, not to legalistically cast them down, but rather to join in in the fellowship for the only goal of being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ and then being launched to where God wanted to send them. And Jim Elliott began to, as he studied where God might take him, began to look with curiosity at the Alca Indians. Shell Oil had built an airfield in Ecuador, and this tribe had murdered people in that process. And people stopped going to this air landing that they had created in the jungle. Why? Because... They wanted no parts of civilization. It was, it was here that Elliot said, this is where I want to go. It was here that he felt the challenge of being able to say, I want to go to the, the toughest place in the world, Lord. Who does that? Is that what you would do? That's what I'm saying. I, I, I'm not sure I'm talking to very many of us. This guy was over the top. But this is what it says here. In Psalm chapter uh, 127, it says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. What Jim Elliot understood was that he was a sharpened arrow. He was training in the Word of God. And as he began to understand that it wasn't about legalism, it wasn't about proving anything to any, anybody, it was that his spirit-led relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ would overflow into a passionate, intense discovery that everybody needed the gospel. Mom and dad tried to talk him out of going to South America to no avail. His letter back to his mom and dad in Oregon, these dear people who loved their son, who wanted him safe, was this. What did you expect, he retorted. 
You, you made me for this purpose. God has brought me as your son. You taught me this. You prepared me for this. This was a part of your doing. And now the Lord has aimed me like a, an arrow in a quiver. I've come out of the quiver. Arrows aren't made to stay in the quiver. That's who kids are. Youngsters are. You are. And Jim Elliott was ready to go. A trained arrow. But he did something. He did something that a lot of people don't do. He decided that he was going to take up a sport that he had never done before in high school, wrestling. Who does that? He got to be out of his mind. Wrestlers are the toughest guys on the planet, I'm convinced. I mean, we football guys aren't like those guys, I don't think. But anyhow, Jim Elliott wanted to wrestle. Why? Because he wanted to be physically and mentally tough to go to any place on the world, the toughest places in the world, and do Christ, and do ministry, and present the gospel to the most hostile, the most opposed people to Christ, perhaps, on the planet. And he started recruiting guys, some of his friends. One guy who was on the football team, a guy who uh, was really popular, was the national orator um, uh, speaker in the country that year, who was going to go to law school in Milwaukee. He talked him out of it. Jim Elliott got their girlfriends and his girlfriend, Elizabeth, and they decided to join hands and get ready for the most gruesome mission trip maybe the world has known. And he represents a number of people who have done that. And so Jim Elliott took his men to the jungle. And they decided while they were there, as they began to share the gospel in this foreign place, in this difficult place to live, now married and, and, and starting to have children, they decided as they were visiting with some of the people, the native people there, that there was not going to be any gun carrying with them. I know we live in a, in a land of uh, the Second Amendment, and I believe there's a place for that. But Jim Elliott did something that was very unusual. He told his men, look, we're not carrying guns. Not even to protect ourselves, we're not. If somebody's going to die, it's going to be us, because we're born-again believers. But these people are not. If they die, they would spend an eternity in a place called hell forever experiencing the wrath of God because they do not understand the gospel. Who does that? Like I said, I'm not sure I'm talking to many people right now. We've got other interests as youngsters in college and high school. We don't seem to care about going on a mission. We don't care about, about people who, who we don't know very well. I'm speaking on behalf of myself as well. We get caught up here in the American dream. But there's a Jesus dream. And the Jesus dream is that the planet would come to know him as Savior and Lord. And Jim Elliott was all about that. And so, Jim Elliott, what a story. Where do you stand in that kind of a situation? Do you have that kind of fervency? That kind of intensity in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you willing to risk your life for the gospel? He who seeks to save his life shall lose it, Jesus said. But he who loses his life for my sake in the gospel will save it. Many said one day to Jesus, I want to be with you. I want to be a disciple. Jesus said, the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Where do you stand? Think on that for a minute. As Coach Brown is challenging us to compete at 100% in all that we do, I know these two athletes are doing that in the arena of competition and beyond. You can't compete at the highest level in our state without it. Beyond that, they love Jesus, and they're excited to be here with you tonight to share what he has done in their life and encourage you to trust in him. So Lexi, 
Bailey, thanks for joining us tonight. And we're just going to get rolling. So thinking about your Instagram bio, Lexi, go ahead, introduce yourself. Who are you and what should they know about you? My name is Lexi Sun. I'm from San Diego, California. I'm a senior volleyball player, outside hitter at the University of Nebraska, and I'm studying communication. Bailey. Yeah, I'm Bailey Timmons. I'm from Denver, Colorado. I'm a senior cross country and track runner at the University of Nebraska, uh, and I'm studying finance. And I've seen you guys compete, and when you compete, you're like kids at heart out there. And so when did that love first begin for you and your sport? Yeah, so I actually played soccer for the first like eight years growing up. Um, and I did not want to play volleyball. My parents forced me into it because I was so tall. So it didn't start great, um, but ever since I started playing, I fell in love with it and have loved it ever since. Okay, go back to the pitch. What what position in soccer? Um, I switched all around. I was like left front, midfield. Okay, so you're a striker, yeah. you're trying to score. Yes. Okay, absolutely. That's yeah. great. Did you play ever play soccer? Uh, when I was like four years old, if that counts. Shut it down after four. Okay, so did. When, did, when did your love for running begin? Yeah, my dad was a runner uh, through college, so he got me into it in like middle school, but I played baseball all throughout my freshman year of high school as well, and so my love for running probably didn't really come alive until sophomore year when I realized, oh, I kind of really like this, so I quit baseball, started doing track and field, and uh, yeah, it's just grown from there. The rest is history. This dude light and fast. Uh, now thinking about the jersey on the number, the, the number on the jersey rather. Yes. Uh, yeah, why Why your number? Um, I'm number 11 and I've always been 11. Um, I think that everyone kind of looks like the number that they are, so I thought that it was fitting. I don't know why, but yeah, here we are. I'm still 11. <laughs> Looks like an 11. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I know you guys don't have numbers, but there's a bib number that doesn't really mean. So just talk me through the flow. Oh, you got a lot going on back there. I know your grandkids are going to thank you for that that photo there on Hustlers.com. Uh, yeah, talk me through. Where, where did that begin? Well, I don't know if they're going to thank me or laugh at me, <laughs> but uh, I really just thought I had the hair for it. And now that we're here, I know I have the hair for it. So we're just going to roll with it at this point. <laughs> okay, that's good. I don't have the hair for it. Uh, so when neither one of you are from the state of Nebraska, right? You're from? Colorado. You're from? San Diego. Okay, so why, why the Husters? Why are you competing here in Lincoln, Nebraska? Yeah, so I initially went to the University of Texas for my freshman year and transferred here. Um, but when I visited here my first time, there is really no place like Nebraska. And I know that everyone, that's their pitch and they say it all the time, but I really didn't believe it until I got here. Um, just the culture and the school and the fans are really like no other place I've ever been. So, yeah. That's awesome. Go Huskers. <laughs> For me, I was really born and raised Husker. My parents both grew up in Nebraska. They both went to Kearney and were big Husker fans. Uh, but honestly, I kind of was like growing up, I was like, you know, I don't think I'm going to go to Nebraska. My dad's like, Nebraska, Nebraska. And I was like, that's not going to be me. And I was looking for schools and uh, I visited and checked it out just because I knew that we had ties here. And uh, it's like Lexi said, there's no place like Nebraska. I was blown away with uh, facilities, what they offer. And then the fans are just incredible. Every sport gets so much support. Husker Nation, you matter. Uh, when, when competing as a Christian athlete, right, transitioning here. Your faith plays a significant role in, in all the hours you spend training and competing. Uh, take me back to the beginning. Uh, what were some of the first memories that you had of God? Yeah, so I am born and raised, or was born and raised in a Christian home. Um, went to a Christian school, K through 12, all of that. Went to church every Sunday. So my memories of God were started really early um, from the very beginning. And I basically don't know anything different. So, yeah, that's where it all began for me. That's awesome. Yeah. Bailey, what's your story? Yeah, like Lexi, grew up in a Christian home, but um, it was I was in public school, so I didn't get the whole K-12 through experience. Uh, and it was a, kind of a, a week weekly thing on Sundays. We'd go to church, and so I knew who God was. I knew uh, who Jesus was, and I um, remember growing up hearing about it. Uh, so, yeah, he was definitely part of my life from an early age. And if you're out there and you're thinking, man, that's my story, or you're like, I can't relate at all. At some point, for every single one of us, our faith has to become our own. So maybe talk me through what brought you to that point where you're thinking, man, I got to get things figured out with God. Yeah. Um, so for me, I definitely was a Christian all of my life. At a young age, I decided and I believed. Um, one thing, actually, it wasn't for a few months ago, um, I realized that I wasn't living an active faith. And 
pursuing an active relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and so that kind of all happened for me in this period of COVID. Um, and during the busyness of everything with sports and school and relationships and family and all of that, I never really uh, realized that I wasn't living out an active faith. Um, and so COVID was kind of a wake up call for me. And God basically stripped away everything, everything that was my life and everything that I had um, and revealed himself to me and said, hey, we this it needs to be you and me first before anything else. Um, and I wouldn't have anything if it weren't for him. So I think that COVID has been a tremendous growing experience for me. And although it has been a really crazy experience for everyone and a really hard experience, um, it, I think it definitely, and God is using it, um, to change lives and he definitely has changed mine. So that's kind of my story with COVID and all of that. Praise God. You know, it talks about God's going to use all things for good for those who uh, love him or are called according to his purpose. That's a, that's case in point, right? COVID has been really, really hard, but praise be to God how he used that time in your life. When, when did God get your attention, Bailey? Yeah, so in high school, um, I struggled a lot with finding my identity and worth in my relationships, and specifically res- relationships with the opposite uh, sex, and really searching for someone else to kind of fill this gap that I felt like I had. Um, And it wasn't until I got here at Nebraska that um, that it all kind of been stripped away similarly. And um, God really just came in and said, look, you're never going to find what you're looking for in these relationships. There's no other human that's ever going to be able to fill that gap that you're searching for in your heart. It's only me that can do that. And that's when it really started to become, like you said, my own. Mm-hmm. You know, growing up, we went to church. Um, I knew God. I knew who Jesus was. Uh, but, you know, there's a verse, two verses maybe in Romans chapter 10. It's, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. And I think when I was younger, I had, I, I had the knowing your uh, head part. I the head knowledge, the right? Head the head knowledge. knowledge. Sure. I knew who Jesus was. I knew what he did. Uh, but I didn't believe it in my heart mm. until God kind of broke in and said, let me fill that hole. Mm. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. Praise God. And I, and I look at these logos and I think of 100%. And that's what God, he expects from us. He says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. But all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave 100. He's the only one ever to do so. And when he died, he was there on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It is finished. That's incredible love, but it didn't end there. Three days later, he rose again, and he's given us an opportunity to do what you guys just did. You repented of your sin, and you believed in upon Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Praise be to God. Now, talk me through what has life been like since then? Yeah, honestly, it's been relieving. It has lifted a huge weight off of my shoulders and before thinking that I could do everything on my own and I'm okay and I don't need God 24 seven. Um, it's just relieved me knowing that God's got my back and I can trust in him in every situation for everything, no matter what. Um, so it's honestly been such a relief for me. Yeah. Wow. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I would agree. And, um, that doesn't mean though that like challenges still aren't coming. Like it's still a challenging life. And um, you may uh, surrender one area to God and then he reveals, hey, let's look at this other area of your life. Like, and you realize sin, you had no idea even existed. And there's this whole nother battle. Um, but when you know Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, that he died for every sin and rose to pay the, the price, there's, yeah, relief, freedom. And to say, it's not my problem. It's not for me to solve. Let me give it to you since you've already paid for it, and let me live in that confidence. Wow. Okay, so that freedom, I think that that shouldn't just be left in the locker room. That shouldn't be just pregame prayer. That should impact the way you train and compete. So, like I said, I know you smile a lot <laughs> when you play. Uh, talk me through, like, why is that? How is that connected to now your relationship? Yeah, um, I like to have fun with it. I think for me, it's more than a sport, um, and I think instead of placing my worth in how I play or my last practice. Instead, I have confidence in my worth in Jesus Christ. And 
I know that and I know full well. And even if we're losing or if I'm playing terribly, I think just having a smile on my face and hopefully helping those around me who maybe are nervous or calm it. Yeah, whatever. Um, I think that that's just what I try to focus on when I'm playing. That's awesome. Now, is that something you can go quick, quick, quick from play to play to play and recalibrate? Or is that something that maybe during timeouts or, or transition in between sets? I mean, how does that work out with, with you, practically speaking? Yeah, um, I think it's kind of a decision that I and a mindset that I have to make before going into the game. Um, and then I think reminding myself throughout the game, if things don't go the way I expected or I want to, then just checking myself and, yeah, getting back to it. That's awesome. Now, you guys have a lot of time to think. <laughs> okay, the gun goes off, and you're going for 8, 15 minutes. I mean, there's a long time. So maybe how do you stay calibrated during your training competition with your relationship with Christ? Yeah, um, I think the big piece there is just remembering um, the suffering that I'm going through is nothing compared to the suffering that Christ had for me on the cross, willingly. He willingly went to the cross to pay for my sins, to like build this relationship with me and offer himself uh, to have this relationship. So in the middle of a, a five-mile race, when you're going hard the whole time and you're ready to just give up, you're like, oh, does this really hurt that bad? Like Christ literally died for me. Um, and it focuses your, your brain to say, I'm going to push through it to glorify him in in that praise god so let's just for a brief second there's prosperity but there's adversity so you were coming into a team that just won a national title yeah and then you came so close and then came up a little bit short so how has christ affected the way that you then look at, at those moments where it's just a little bit short there's yeah a moment of adversity it's hard it hurts yeah it's definitely humbled me um i think that just knowing and embracing the fact that everyone does go through adversity and no matter what it looks like. And yes, losing a volleyball game is not going to be the end of the world, but yeah, it does hurt. Um, and I think embracing that and also using that for motivation and to learn different lessons from that situation and taking something away from it instead of just it being a loss. Yeah, that's awesome. And I know you, Bailey, have faced a lot of injuries, right? So I was thinking about it. Was it three stress fractures in your femur in 12 months? Yeah, three separate stress reactions in a 12-month span. That's crazy. It forced to stop competing altogether. Mm -hmm. Just stop training. You were just waiting it out. Yeah, three separate times. It's six, six weeks off for healing. So, so talk so. me through that. How did Christ help you in that moment and grow you through that moment? Yeah, um, when you, you're not able to practice, you're not able to train, compete, um, you have a lot of time to sit there and just kind of think. You're in the trainers a lot. You're you're staying off it. You're you're doing whatever you got to do, and um, the first time I was angry. You know, I was like, why, why, like this this sucks. Um, second time, third time, Christ just kept God just kept growing me to say, look, your sport's not everything. Right? It can be taken away like that. Right. Um, so it it forced me to kind of rethink and refocus my heart to say, what, what am I really valuing is most important? Is it my ability to train and compete and, and show people what I can do on the track? Or is it who I am in Christ? Amen. And that's a child of God. Like, um, so I really grew in, in being confident in that no matter what adversity hit and how many injuries came. Wow. Praise God. Love is stronger than death. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. And the love of Christ can compel you then to give 100. So to wrap up, knowing what we know now, what would you tell the people watching? What it means to respond to the 100% Christ gave for us? Yeah, I think because Christ gave 100%, um, and he also gave us these abilities to play the sport that we love, we then can just owe it to him to give 100% in our sport and not to glorify ourselves, but to glorify him. So that's how we can translate that 100%. Wow, praise God. That's good. What do you got? I think it just goes back to what I was saying earlier, that he gave 100%, and he went to the full extent of dying on a cross, a real death, real pain, as he was doing that willingly for us. So when we can respond and giving our 100%, knowing it can't come close to his 100%, but giving our 100% to glorify Christ in what we do. Um, it's just the mindset and the heart posture while you're doing it is 
is to glorify Christ and nothing can tear you down. Yeah. Amen. So we're grateful for this time together. Thank you guys for sharing of your time. We pray that this has been a blessing to you and, and may the grace of Christ that is sufficient and the power that may perfect in weakness really bless you this week. One of the most impactful moments at Weekend of Champions is huddle time, where we come together to talk about the message. We are going to give you 10 minutes to go through the questions on the screen. There will be a countdown to come back live. We'd love to hear your responses in the chat, so put them out there.
perhaps you had a, a little time to think through, where do you stand in this? I, I'm assuming, based on what I've seen in American culture and Christianity, that this is a little too deep. Th- this stuff is too deep. The thing about dying for your faith, the thing about turning down law school or pro ball or, you know, being the most popular here, there, going here, doing this, and all these fun things in America, and just going somewhere, not just somewhere, but the most, to the most violent scenario that you could go to to share the good news of Jesus Christ, it's over the top. Like I said, it's rare. Who does that? Maybe I'm only talking to one or two people. I hope I'm talking to somebody. We don't all get the privilege that Jim Elliott had to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ, but it was going well. They were experiencing God's pleasure there. And then one day it turned on them. If you ever want to see the story, there's a movie that came out a number of years ago called The Tip of the Spear. And uh, it describes what Jim Elliott and his men experienced. The day that many feared, the day that mom and dad Elliot feared, finally came. Yes, those in the Alka Indian tribe who were being witnessed to one day turned on these men. These men who did not have protection that we would kind of want to relish, guns and ammunition to protect themselves because they were already protected. Jim Elliott had a whole unique view, but is it that unique? It's actually what the Bible says. The men were murdered for their faith. They died as martyrs in 1956. The wives and the children lived and returned to America. You look back at that story and you go, what was it all worth? That's what we're living for? You mean to tell me that that that's really the most important thing? What kind of life is that? (laughs) But, oh, those wives and those children got home and they started thinking about that life. And they started thinking about the souls, the souls that had murdered their husbands. And I will tell you something, and this may sound really weird to you, particularly us people in America, but the souls of those violent men who killed their precious husbands became more valuable than the souls of their precious husbands because they knew where their husbands were. And they they recognized that these men would die and go to hell. And so they went back to the jungle with their families, the children, the woman, to finish what God had started through Jim Elliott and those men. I'm telling you, that is one of the greatest stories of all time in history here in America, in American Christendom. And we don't hear it enough. We get bought off with all kinds of other stuff. People who are like that are rare. Now, we're not all going to have the privilege to die for the cause of Christ like that. And I call it a privilege. Seven of the eight New Testament writers were murdered for their faith according to church history. And the other one was exiled on an island called Patmos where he wrote Revelation. These men were chased down. They were hammered down. And there are many people across the planet the same way. What about us? FCA kids, FCA families, adults, parents. What are we all about? What, the, uh, the next <laughs> compliment we get in social media? Our job status? The economy? Whether our team you know, wins the championship, whether my son is playing, my daughter's playing in a game? What's wrong with the coach? <laughs> you know, sports has, in my mind, has become a parable and a crucible and it's transferable. And I use that as an acronym, 100%, 100 PCT. Let me read something to you 
in 2 Timothy that I think really reminds me of Jim Elliott and why I say that this is normal to God, what Jim Elliott did. It's not abnormal. It's normal. It says, Then my child, Paul talking to Timothy, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering. Share in suffering a good soldier of Christ, Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Paul is saying to young Timothy, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. This is the last letter Paul wrote. He was beheaded shortly after he wrote this letter to his young understudy, Timothy, who was his spiritual son. Timothy was probably a young man around 18, 19, 20 years old, getting ready to pastor some churches that Paul had started. And he was telling Timothy, you can't be weak, man. You gotta have a mojo for Christ. You're gonna have to endure hardness. He had told Timothy later on in this letter, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but rather a power of love and a sound mind. We don't operate out of fear anymore. We have a new kingdom now. We no longer serve the king of this world. We don't, we don't just kind of uh, uh, just drift along like every other teenage kid. We don't live like that. We have a new king named Jesus and a new kingdom that we get to advance. And so Paul lets him know that, son, you've got to get serious. In this last letter that he wrote, are you willing to suffer? FCA kids. Are you willing to use the sport that you plan, whether it's wrestling or track and field or volleyball or football or basketball or baseball, uh, weightlifting, whatever it is that you do? You coaches out there, are we using God to get our stuff? Oh, gimme, 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 Lord. Or are we using the sport like Jim Elliott did to get God's stuff, to, do, to produce in us a Christ-like character so that we can go out and rock the world for Jesus Christ, bravely and courageously. And so I, I see here these three metaphors in Scripture, a soldier, an athlete, a farmer. And these, were, these, these guys were alpha males in Paul's day, but I think they, it talks to females, obviously, as well. You know what? <laughs> it's a physical, intense view of how Christ should be lived on this planet. And it says here that a soldier doesn't get entangled in the affairs of this life. A born-again Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, doesn't get entangled in, in your Facebook and, and social media. And he said, she said. And all the little things in life that really don't matter all that much. How I look. How I compare. What does she think? What does he think? All of that, that's not how we live. We don't get entangled in these things. Our only mission, our only aim, and what is the aim? It's the highest aim we have. Our only goal is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Flat out, bond servant obedience. Period, end of story. What more do you need? What more do I need? But this is heavy. This is not what we want to hear. Paul goes on to say, an athlete isn't crowned until he competes according to the rules. What rules? You know, I talked to my daughters once and I said, uh, oh, how does football work, girls? Do you know, understand, like, what are the rules in football? Like, how do you win in the game of football? They said, Dad, that's easy. You're a football coach. You ought to know that. I said, well, I know, I know. But I'm, I'm asking a rhetorical question to you. What do you have to do? Said, well, you, you score the most points. You have the most points and you win the game. And I said, that's right. I said, so, so that would be true of gin rummy too, right? We play gin rummy. If you have the most cards at the end, you win, right? No, dad. It's when you lose all your cards, you win. 
Oh, I said, so there, you're telling me there's different rules for different games. They said, that's right, Dad. The rules don't, don't, don't just, they aren't the same for everything. Just like Dad, it's like checkers and chess. They have different rules and it's a different game. Oh, yeah, now I get it. Huh. Well, I think we all get that. The question is what we don't get is we think that the rules are the same for the non-Christian kid and the Christian kid. We think that the rules are the same for the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And they're drastically different. The scorecard is very different. You don't keep score the same way. And we haven't learned that. We still think as Christian athletes, the most important thing is that you won the game. Er, wrong answer. Does that mean that God doesn't want us to compete and play to win? No, of course he wants us to play to win. That is the strategy. But there's something higher than that. And that is that I would glorify Jesus Christ in the process and become more like Christ. And it isn't about me and my playing time and, and, and how far I go in my career and how much money I make and all that kind of stuff. This is what Jim Elliott understood at a young age. The Bible says in Romans 8.13, by the Spirit of God, put to death the deeds of the flesh. you got to stamp out the gravitational pull in our lives that wants to exalt ourselves and wants to live by the rules of the world and say that we're Christians. Er, wrong answer. You might be a believer. You might have trusted Jesus Christ authentically as Savior and Lord. But it's very possible for you, because you're not a doer of the word, to be double-minded. And the Bible says in James 1.8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Jim Elliott understood that. Now, now, yeah, he got a little legalistic. Yeah, he wasn't perfect. But there was, a, there was a fire inside his belly that wanted to please God. That was his aim. That wanted to compete according to the rules of the kingdom. And then finally... The farmer, the hardworking farmer gets the first share of the crops. Listen, a lot of times I think we think that God does all the work. We don't earn our salvation. Our salvation is a gift from God. We recognize that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead, and fully paid for our sins. But the transaction is not complete until we raise our hand and say, yes, I trust in that, in what Jesus did on the cross for me, that he is God the Son, he rose from the dead, proving he's God, and now I trust him, accept him as my Savior and Lord. I repent from my sin and I walk with him. That's a gift from God. But to grow in Christ is work. It is a work of the Holy Spirit as we work to allow ourselves for, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ to be conformed in us. And that's the process that happened to Jim Elliot. And it made him radically different. Listen, <laughs> there are a lot of us that are compromising because we want a little piece of this and we want a little piece of that. We want both worlds. And Jesus said, you can't have both. You gotta choose one. The hardworking farmer. The Bible tells us, study to show thyself approved. A great barometer to where you're at in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ is how much of this word you long for and you're desiring for the, for the, for the milk and the meat of this word. When my little daughters were born, they came out screaming and crying. Why? My wife tried to convince me that they're hungry. That's why. I kept thinking, they got loving parents. They got a, they got a roof over their head. What's their problem? <laughs> but they're hungry, she said. And they were right. And they have to keep eating and eat and eat and eat. And they grow and they grow and they grow. Do you hunger and thirst for God's word? Do you cry and scream out for God's word? How long can you go, apart from the word of God, spending time with him, Devoting your athletics, devoting your work, your schoolwork, everything. How long can you go not thinking about Jesus Christ, not thinking about this as an offering to him? 
if, if, if that's a long time, in other words, if you can go a week, if you can go a month, if, if you, you just, every now and then when you go to FCA, that's the only time you think about it, something's wrong. When babies come out of the womb and they're not crying, something is really wrong. That should be a red flag. If you're not thinking much about the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, maybe you've decided to get on, but if that's not a regular habit for you, something's wrong. As I close here, sports like Jim Elliott showed us is really a training ground. It's a launching pad for where God wants to take us in our life. It's not the end. It's a process. The Bible tells us in Psalm 84, 11, there's no good thing that God will withhold from us if we walk uprightly. God will use the sports world to show you what good things are. This is the world we live in. We live in the world of wrestling. We live in football. We live in basketball. That's the world we all live in. Thank God for that. It's a wonderful gift from God. But it's not an end to itself. It's a means. It's a way to show us what God really wants to bless us with. He wants to change our desires to his desires. And he wants our prayer life now to be now wanting what he wants for our life. So as I close, I just want to ask you one more time. Can you relate to Jim Elliott? Or is that too much? Look, it's okay to be honest and say, yeah, it's too much. I think I'm only ready for a very minor league walk like this. I just want to say to you, settling for mediocrity is something that God is very, very sad about. And if that's where you're at, you're going to be miserable. There's only one way to live. And Jim Elliott understood that. It was all out for the Lord Jesus Christ with everything you got. The Bible says, do your work heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. And so I'm asking you to reconsider, as it says in this portion of Scripture, where those three, the soldier, the athlete, the farmer, verse 7 says, consider what I say, Paul said to Timothy. Meditate, consider what I'm saying. Just view me tonight as a warning. <laughs> you may not have liked what I've said tonight. I'm just a mailman. That's all I am. And guess what? The mailman gets mail too. <laughs> so you can get mad at me all you want. But the scriptures are challenging you and reminding you more than anything that Jim Elliott wasn't some abnormal, weird guy, over-the-top Christian guy who you would respect and consider cool. Jim Elliott is the norm for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why those disciples lived. That's how God himself lived when he left heaven and came to earth and walked this planet. And the scripture reminds us to share in the sufferings of Christ so that would we, we would be more like him and that we would reveal to a world that's in darkness and in desperate need the reality of Jesus Christ. I want to be one of those guys. And I hope you do too. God bless you. Let me pray us out. Father God, I just thank you for the opportunity to share a story that was true. And although, Lord, I may have not, I have all the, the, the exact details of it, Lord, hopefully there was enough of the truth there, Lord, everything that I knew to be truth, that it would paint a picture for us, the way Paul painted a picture for Timothy with the soldier and the athlete and the farmer, that a modern-day parable, 100%, that there is a crucible that goes with it, the sea part. The heat that comes from walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the tea, Lord, that it would transfer into other areas of life. It would be transferable. Father, that we're not going to stay athletes the rest of our life, but you're using what's going on in the sports world today to bring out the reality of Jesus Christ in the next lane that you've called us to run in. I pray that for the state of Nebraska. I pray there would be a faithful response.
to the gospel message of Jesus Christ and the growth message, the sanctification of being coming more and more like Jesus Christ. May we die to ourselves and live unto you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Brown. For one final time, we're going to turn you loose for huddle discussion. The questions and countdown time will be on the screen. Going back and forth with others around the Word of God is one of the most important things we can ever do. Don't be shy. Be bold about what you're honestly thinking with those around you. And to spur other huddles on around the state, please continue to share your takeaways in the chat. Have at it.
Hope you had a great huddle discussion. Right after Voda leads us in worship one last time, we will be awarding the winners of the social media challenge, so stay tuned. Now, get up on your feet and let's get our praise on. Here's Voda. I think one of our greatest desires is to be known, is to be seen, but beyond that, to be accepted, to be loved for what is seen. The irony in that is we're so good at hiding, we're so good at portraying ourselves always in the best light. We do it on social media. We do it with our friends. There's a version of us we want to be all the time. And then there's the real story of who we are, of our fears, our doubts, our failures, our shame. And in that hiding, sometimes the people closest to us, we don't let them in. We're afraid to. We wonder if they might run or not be there for us if they knew how difficult things are for us, how much struggle we're going through, how much pain we might be enduring. It's tough to walk alone, and so many of us are doing it. I think that's where the devil wins is when we walk alone, we just think, nobody has time for my issues. Nobody has time for my pain. I don't want to burden anybody with what I've got going on. There's so much power in all of you guys. And if you can get to the point to be bold enough to be honest with some of the things you're struggling with, We each have different struggles, some of them the same, but there's power when we're united. I hope you have somebody, one or two people in your life that you just take a risk, you let them know what your struggles are so you're not walking alone. Here's what's amazing. God sees it all. and He loves you unbelievably. No matter what he sees, There's freedom in that. He knows every thought, every failure. He knows what's coming. He knows the stumblings that you have in the future. He knows your past. He knows your hurt, and he wants to enter into all of it, and he loves you in spite of what he sees. He adores you, so don't hide. There's no hiding from God, so embrace it. Say, God, this is me. These are my words. Here's where I hurt. Here's where I'm having trouble trusting you. Why did you allow this in my life? Why is my family this way? Whatever it is, lay it at the feet of Jesus. Bring it to him. Don't stop bringing it to him. Come as you are. The gospel is for you. God's love is for you. He wants you to be his child just as you are. So stop resisting. Bring yourself before the living God that loves you. This is called honestly. i 
Now we're going to announce the winners of the social media challenge. Come on now. If you're excited to see who wins, post a woo-hoo or a yes in the chat. Our state director, Chris Bubach, likes to say, you can't improve on something you've never done before. We know this was something new. We know this was something different. We had one huddle. Boldly step up and pioneer the way for the rest of the state. Huge respect to Bridgeport High School for honoring Coach Tony McGrath, who's leaving a legacy for Christ. Go Bulldogs! If we're trying to go 100% and want to max this thing out, though, we're going to give you a second chance. Between now and December 1st, in a 100% fashion, come on, we want to see who else will step up and complete these challenges. But for the final challenge, this is it. Bragging rights. For the last year, it was, it was Nebraska Christian and Central City High School. They won the top 10 at Weekend of Champions. Many of you may not be with your entire huddle tonight. So take a picture of yourself and those you're with and send it to the person who runs your social media account. That person is to mesh those pictures together and make one post. That's one post. So you're saying... If half of my huddle is with me and half of my huddle is with Coach Escamilla. That's right. And he's the guy that does all the social media. I send him the picture and then he'll send in our huddle to FCA. You got it. That's it. So tag at FCA Nebraska and add hashtag FCA Top 10 Huddles 2020 and FCA NOC 2020. Again, one more time. Take a picture and post for your school, representing who all is watching in tonight, and tag at FCA Nebraska and add hashtag FCA Top 10 Huddle 2020 and FCA NOC 2020. And we will announce the top 10 huddles that tuned in tonight on December 1st. Now to coaches, this is for you. For 34 years, I was in your shoes. I was the coach with my huddle and student athletes wanting them to know the relationship they could have with the one true God by repenting of their sin and trusting in the risen Christ. Right. What a joy to think back on the many athletes who will now live forever with God in heaven 
because of trusting in Jesus during their high school career. Mm. It impacted the way they trained, competed, and lived their life. They were free. We desire that for you. Coaches, I'd love for you to have that same experience. We want to help you lead your athletes to Christ. And let's not leave this in the film room. Let's break the huddle and take this to the field. So right now, identify one person you can share one thing with from tonight. Set a reminder in your phone. Do whatever it takes. We don't want to simply sit and receive. We want to go and make disciples. We're praying every single one of you is impacted by tonight. Everyone, get out your phone. Okay. This is the challenge. For us to go 100%, we want you to go 100%, and we will follow up with you. Text this code, FCA1623. That's FCA1623 to the number 46322. That's my guy. Then follow the directions on the screen. If you're a new Christian, again, catch your attention. If you're a new Christian as a result of tonight, reply one. And if you're already a Christian and want to grow in your relationship with Jesus, reply two. You'll then be asked for your zip code. Then be sure to click the link and provide some contact information to access resources to help you grow. We're going to give you a brief moment now to complete that on your phone. Thanks a ton for taking the time to fill that out. Mm -hmm. The FCA leader in your area will follow up with you and help you take the next step in living 100% committed to Christ. If you desire to stick around with your huddle to talk more about what you learned tonight, please feel free. As we head into this week, let's respond to Jesus giving 100% by trusting God and working hard. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us while we were still sinners. Jesus, thank you for coming and facing everything we have faced yet without sin. And you were willing to take on our sin at the cross and be punished for it under the right judgment of God. But three days later, you rose again to give us forgiveness and grace and mercy if we would repent and believe. May we do that and keep with repentance. Keep with turning from ourselves to trust in you and you alone for our salvation. May that set us free and set us on fire to worship you with our lives. May the world around us know you because of the way in which that we live in a 100% way. We need your grace. Holy Spirit, fill us and lead us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. Let's Thank go get them. Yeah.